The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This episode is brought to you by Capital Group, one of the oldest and largest asset management companies in the world, managing multi-asset, equity and fixed income investment strategies for different types of investors. Since 1931, Capital Group has been singularly focused on delivering superior, consistent results for long-term investors using high conviction portfolios, rigorous research and individual accountability. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I'm James Wrigley and today we're going to talk about uh, career paths into financial advice, professional year uh, and you know the different ways that people can find themselves ending up in, in financial advice. Uh, I've spoken previously on different podcasts about my own journey and the older that I get, as much as I hate to admit that I'm getting old these days, I get a lot of younger people asking me about what did I do and what was it like and so forth. So I've asked Joel Gleason and Julian Manning who, who both work with me here at First Financial, both have very different career paths to get to where they're at, uh, to maybe talk through what they've been doing and what they've been up to. So guys, thanks for, for joining me today. Thanks for having me on, James. Yeah, thanks very much, James. It's all good. Good to good to have a chat with you with you both, or at least recorded anyway, so we speak fairly regularly. So maybe both of you, maybe we start, Joel, we'll start with you. What are you up to today? Like, what is your job in financial advice today? Where are you at? Yeah, so I work um, in, as part of James's broader pod um, under an advisor. Um, his name's Paul Kubik, and I'm uh, his associate. So I work directly with him, and we service um, his clients as a team. I think it's roughly around 130 of them. So, and then as an extension to that, I'm doing my professional year as well, which we're going to discuss today sort of with the ambition to move into an advice role um, in the near future. And how long have you been doing the role of an associate for now? So, I started at First Financial in an associate role under another advisor in September 2019, um, but have been in the industry um, since sort of the start of 2019. Um, yep. Worked in other arms of um, financial services in the past, um, but uh, yeah, decided to land on um, financial advice um, and yeah, I've been... It's been a few years now, and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, nice. And Julian, how about you? What are you, what are you up to today? Yeah, so similar to Joel, I'm an associate advisor, obviously directly under you, James. Um, yeah. So I do much the same as as what Joel does with Paul. And I'm also going through my professional year, almost at the end of quarter two. Uh, yeah, just waiting for the, the exam results for that. Yep, nice, nice. And so I wanted to I get asked questions often about you know. What did I study and what have I done and different jobs that I've had and, and so forth. So, uh, as I said, you, you two have very – you're doing somewhat similar jobs now but have gotten to that point in very different um, manner. Um, so, maybe, Joel, if we start with you, can we can we kind of go back to – you finished high school. What happened after that? What did you do after that? Yeah, so, went through high school and, and throughout high school, I did basically every sort of businessy type of subject that – that school offered at the time, so I, I had that way inclined. So um, after I finished school, I studied at RMIT and did a, a Bachelor of Economics and Finance. Um, it was an applied course, so th- with that, it meant that I had to do a year working in the industry. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, during that period, I worked uh, at a shipping company, of all things, um, in the marketing department, <laughs> which is a little bit different, but um, that was an example of what I did there. I did it a little bit, took a little bit longer than I suppose it would normally take um, in that I also did an exchange overseas. Um, so, it, it just extended the degree out a little bit. But um, but when I did eventually come back, I got a job in uh, mortgage broking is a, in a client services type role. Um, didn't feel like that was you know, such a great fit for me. So, um, I had a few sort of mentors in my life that, that were in the financial advice space and uh, I thought that would be a really good area for me. So, that's when I shifted 
you know, into a, what was a smaller financial advising practice for, for a couple of months I worked there and then ultimately onto First Financial. Yeah. So, so you, you only did a couple of months elsewhere before before the associate role at First Financial? Yeah, uh, it was yeah about a six to seven month period um, yep. there. In a client services role? Client services style role, yep. Um, and didn't, it wasn't quite a fit for me. It was quite far away from home. Just think little things like that. Um, and then a, a, what I thought was a really good opportunity at First Financial opened up. Yep. So I, I took that. But yeah, I suppose. And then in terms of studying, um, so obviously I did the, the bachelor. Um, but with the, the sort of the new changes since the Royal Commission, there's now the obligation to do like a specified course to become a financial advisor. And my course, my bachelor's didn't fall into that. Mm-hmm. So that's why I've also done the, the graduate diplomer of financial planning with okay. Plan. So is that the eight subject? Is that yeah. that's eight subjects? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, eight subjects. Um, so that's I finished that now, um, and. If I want to, I'm four subjects away from a master, but I'll, I'll put that into big asterisks if I want to. <laughs> I reckon everyone that does that, so I did a similar course as well, but yeah. everyone, they get to the end of it and they go, oh, if only I did four more, then I'll have a master's. But I yeah. don't know how many people actually go back and do the well, master's. Well, first financial make us uh, do another <laughs> SMSF-related subject, so I'm doing that at the moment. Mm-hmm. So another way to look at it is three more to go, but yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll I have to put a bit of thought into that. So, so does the SMSF one, would that count towards the Masters, would it? Yep. Yeah. So, currently, all right now, as we speak, I'm actually enrolled in the Masters of, at Kaplan. Uh, it's whether I decide to continue to to do the next three that I need to finish the Masters. Yeah. So, yeah okay. Hmm. So, a little bit closer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and so, how was how did you find doing the studying at Kaplan whilst you were working at the same time? How was that? Yeah, it's 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 challenging. There's no no doubt about it. It fell in an interesting time in everyone's lives, I suppose. While parts of it were during the COVID period, so in a way, you were home a lot of the time. Um, so you didn't feel like you're missing out and doing many other things that, that surround your life, such as social things, because everyone was stuck at home as well. But there's yeah. no doubt it was challenging. Um, and I, right now, I'm doing another subject. So yeah, you know, I find after work, I've got to set aside a couple of more hours. To study, so it's it is hard. But one thing I do find it it's it's actually very satisfying when you when you finish it. Um, yep. When you you look back and you go, I've done this while working, and I've been able to get through this. Like it, it, there is a, a really good bit of satisfaction when you see the results and it, when you pass it, you get through. And do you find much you know, much application either of what you're doing at work to the studies? Does that make understanding your studies easier, or vice versa, what you're learning in the well, study? If- it was, yeah, it was definitely very applicable. So, um, learning things such as contributions, how they work, starting, stopping, pension, all the things that we do on a daily basis, it was very applicable to yep. um, to the to the studying. So, um, it was useful. I did learn a lot. Um, but at the same time, being at First Financial and and working day to day and experiencing those things is, is just as valuable as well. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, just got the piece of paper kind of to back up the. It's exactly. a real work experience that you exactly yeah you have. Well, yeah now Julian how about how about you I know you've got a, a bit of a different career path to to get to to where you're at talk us through so you, you've just had your thirtieth birthday yeah yep. so happy yep. birthday thank you uh, for for that uh, you came to financial advice a little bit later in life can yes, you maybe yeah. talk us through huh? go back to you okay you're finished high school yep. what did you do after that and then how have you ended up where you are. Yeah, so out of high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do for work. I always knew it was something that helping people uh, is what I wanted to do. So when I was in my final year of high school, I had just a, a part-time job at the local liquor store, Safe Bay Liquor. From there, I sort of moved on to a full-time role at Dan Murphy's. Still had no idea of, of what I was going to do, so I was sort of just bouncing around jobs and got into warehousing in sort of construction nuts and bolts. And then from there, I worked for the same boss for the next five, six years. There. And uh, I eventually went into a sales rep job in electrical components. And it was just one day I was sitting on the couch with my wife and brother-in-law talking about the stock market. And I, at that time, I, I knew nothing about it, knew nothing about financial planning, tax, anything like that. I was talking about the stock market and then I started to do some research into it and what jobs will lead from the stock market. I started getting into investing and found that financial planning is actually a really good way of, of helping people. So while I was still... Uh, doing sort of sales repping, I started doing uni. 
So before I even got into the industry, started my bachelor's degree through University of South Australia. And then not long after I started that, I got an entry-level role into a client services role at a, at a firm on Collins Street. I was in that role for about six months before moving into a paraplaning role in the same firm. And then uh, had a few changes and bounced to another role in paraplaning and then ended up about just over a year ago with you, James, being your associate. Yep. And so what what was the the degree you were doing through a uni SA? What, what was so that? It was a, a Bachelor of Business majoring in financial planning, which met, met all the new standards. Okay. So there's there's no further study required from that. Like Joel, you had to go and do the grad dip. Mine was all pure purely for financial planning and met all the new requirements. Yeah. And and so how okay, so one it's in South Australia and you live in Victoria. So yep. I imagine that's via via distance. Like how how was that course delivered to you? What did you yeah, do? Yeah, so it was hundred percent online. So we had a had a portal online where we would have all of our coursework uploaded, we'd have all of our lectures on there, we'd have weekly zooms for all the different subjects, and all of our exams were also done online as well. So I could do it. 100 percent remote so were they those lectures were they pre-recorded lectures or you sat through a lecturer host doing something on zoom so they were all pre-recorded yeah so they were all uploaded so you could do it as as quick or as slow as you like uh, each subject went for 10 weeks at a time also oh, there was in that 10 weeks there were set due dates for set assignments uh, and then once a week you'd have a live question and answer with the the teachers gotcha so so it wasn't so much like the, the university experience maybe that Joel had and, and, and I would have had where your year was typically broken up into semesters. You know, semester one, you did four subjects. Semester two, you did four subjects. And after three years, you've done your, your, you've done your whatever you needed to do. And, yeah, correct. You know, so the, the Uni of SA, they're basically the easiest way to explain that it's like a school year. Yeah. So there's, there's four terms basically that go for 10 weeks each and you do two subjects in each term. So you're only doing two subjects at a time. They both go for 10 weeks. And without a time, through that time, you have your assignments, and then in the final week, you have your exam. They always open the the coursework a week or two early. So if you're on the ball, you tend to jump in and try and uh, try and get the first five or six weeks done in the first couple of weeks. That way, coming towards the end of the exam, you could slow down a little bit and regroup. Gotcha. And and so that you so see, you said you're doing two subjects at a time. Was there any capacity to do more or less? Like, could you do one or could you do three? Yes, yeah, so I could do. One, if I wanted to, sometimes I could have done three. Uh, if I would do one, it would mean the three year degree would basically go to a six year degree. Yeah. And that's not something I wanted to do. And doing a third subject, it would have been very, very challenging because I was work- working full time at the same time as well. And so, so how, how did you manage that doing you know, two university subjects and working at the same time? It, it wasn't easy. There was a lot of sacrifice, yeah. uh, but. It was the COVID times as well, which made things a little easier because, like Joel said, you're at home, so you had a five-kilometer radius, you couldn't really go very far. So that helped, but there was a lot of sacrifices. You missed out on a lot of things with friends, but you sort of had to do that. It was the, the short-term pain for the, the long-term gain. Yeah. And so how long ago did you completely finish the, the uni? Uh, so I finished December 2022, so only just recently. Yep. Um, got the, the official results. And then I actually got my little certificate in the mail a couple of weeks ago. That was that was nice to have that because I, I didn't go up for the graduation because it was in Adelaide. Yeah. So if anyone contemplating a career change would you know, would we got it got any would you would you do anything differently next time around? Like if if you were doing it again, I was more looking to the different pathways into financial advice because I just saw that there was a bachelor's degree and do that, knowing that there was graduate diplomas, diploma of financial planning, and there's other pathways into it. Find out what suits you because doing the Bachelor of Business, there's a lot of subjects that are business related, not so much financial planning related. Gotcha. That weren't as, as interesting to me as the financial planning subjects, where I believe sort of the, the graduate diploma and things like that are purely on financial planning. With the Bachelor of Business, it has a, a wide range of different subjects and not all of them will be applicable. Do either of you, there's a question to either of you, I, I don't know the answer, and so I'm asking you, do, like, can you, so Jolly, you did like the, the graduate diploma. You know, if you didn't have a degree to begin with, could you have just done the graduate diploma and gotten to where you need to get to? Or is it you have to do the master's? Like, I believe you need to do the diploma of financial planning, so the DFP, and then yeah. go into the graduate diploma after that. Uh, okay, right. So the DFP is eight subjects, I believe, and then I think the graduate diploma 
is another eight subjects. It's eight up length, Joel, or is it 12? Yeah, no, I, all I, all, I, don't, I haven't researched the question, but I do remember when I went through the process of getting into the um, graduate diploma, I needed to give my bachelor's transcript, academic transcript. So that was something they asked for. So Yeah. I think I recall having to do the same thing. Not to when when I went through it, it's just pure fluke that I did the I did my university degree, uh, I did a commerce degree, and then some similar to to you guys, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I started doing this graduate diploma before I was even in financial advice, and uh, ended up doing the four specialist subjects at the end that made it financial advice related. But yeah, I think I could only do that because I had a degree to begin with. I remember someone else back then when I was doing that, someone else that was working with me back then, went on, he had to do the master's. And this is under old rules. It's not the current rules. He had to do the master's because he didn't have a university degree right. uh, to get some particular qualification, whatever it was. Okay. So that's so I guess so that I guess different pathways to kind of ticking you off to say, hey, you've done the education requirements to be a to be a financial advisor. What what comes next after that? Yeah, so uh, I suppose from from my point of view, really the next part to to build up, and I suppose is the main reason we're going to be changing today, is starting that that professional year. Yeah. Um, so, and with that, I think it comes with a li- little bit more. Right, so you've got you've been working in as an associate, you've done your education, so you should have a you know a a, a solid you know grounding in the strategic elements and and sort of some of the investment piece side of what we do, insurance as well. Um, but then once you really start your professional year and getting into, okay, I want to be an advisor, it's all right. It goes, all right, well, now we need to shift to ultimately you're going to be sitting in a room in front of a client and and going through a review or a, a statement of advice presentation. Um, now you need to build those skills, you know, those, those soft skills of presenting and, and making sure you explain something that can be complex in an easy way for clients to understand. Um, so that's... As James and know, we, we talk quite a lot, and, and as Paul as well, that's been a big focus of mine. So that's where that's where your, your career development shifts to. I feel that's the that's the the next challenge, if yeah, so to speak. Yeah. So why don't we? So there's four quarters to the professional year. Yep. Uh, maybe Joel, why don't you? Actually, we'll start there. Wait. So Julian, why don't you? Can you talk about what's required of you for the first two quarters, given that you're you're kind of just about at the end of quarter two, you're waiting for your exam. So so what's required of you in the first two quarters? And then Joel, I'll get you to comment on what's required of you in the last two quarters, because that's kind of where you're sitting right now. Yeah, certainly. So the first quarter is basically just an observation quarter, they call it. So it's basically just shadowing an advisor, sitting in meetings and watching how they present things, deal with client scenarios. So quarter one's pretty straightforward. You've got to do some, some a certain amount of hours in sort of back office hours, um, some ROA preparation, things like that, and more shadowing. So it's, the first one's pretty straightforward. Uh, quarter two is a little bit more challenging. So uh, you're not so much shadowing. You've actually got to start presenting to clients. So I believe the PY laws are six client meetings that you have to be starting to present. But on top of that, there's hours you've got to complete and also you've got to write some statement of advices and some strategic ROAs and have them ticked off. But before you can move on to quarter three, you've got to pass the advisor exam. That's probably one of the, the biggest hurdles. So I have them every three months. And so you're just, you're just sat, you've just sat that exam. How, how was the exam? Uh, I did a lot of preparation for it. So hopefully I have a positive result. It was certainly challenging. Mm. But most of it's multiple choice with about five or six short answer questions, but the multiple choice were very open ended. Uh, I found that two of the answers were very, very similar. So yeah, you really need to relate it back to the question and spend a lot of time reading the questions to get the insight to what the right answer would actually be. So and then you have to go just on yourself. In the exam, they give you a whole lot of materials that you can, you know. Yeah, correct. It's not an open book exam; it's a closed book exam. But hey, they give you a few materials that you can reference to. Did, did you find yourself digging through that material much in that in trying to answer some of the questions? Yeah, I certainly did, especially around sort of the AML acts and the privacy acts. They were probably the main ones that, that stumped me a little bit. Uh, but having it all there on hand and being on a computer, you can just control F and, and search, made things a lot easier. So a, a lot of the lead up and preparation was searching through those documents and how to what code words to basically use to find certain parts of the act. Gotcha. Part of the preparation. 
Yep. And, and so what did you do in terms of studying for the exam? So I did the TAL masterclass, which was very insightful. Uh, so it goes for about five hours just on demand. Yeah, right. Um, watch all the different videos. They give you some readings of different acts to read, like the Corpse Act, AML, Privacy Act, and a pile of other ones. Uh, and then they have a little, they have a 30 question practice exam at the end of that. But then also, when you register for the exam, there's a 115 question practice exam that you can do online. And that gives you all the answers once you complete it. And it gives you feedback also as well. So it was, to tell you why that answer is the correct one and why some of the answers are incorrect. So I do a lot of reading um, and multiple practice exams. Good luck. So hopefully you'll get your results soon. And yeah, I guess it's another pass. three weeks, I believe. So I'm not going to count in. Yes. And, and so Joel, you've you're been through this process already. You know, you've obviously ticked off quarter one, quarter two with writing your SOAs and ROAs and sitting the exam. Uh, how did how did you find the exam? And and I guess where are you at in your professional year? Yeah, so I'll touch on the exam first. Yeah, I reiterate a lot of the things that Julie mentioned there. It's 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 not it's a little bit challenging. Like you got you, you do have to study for it. So it's something that you could just roll in and and complete. I've got to listeners if you're experienced in the industry um, and you think you can just go into it. I don't think that will get get you very far. You still need to be actually to, to study the material. So I did that last year, and thankfully I, I did pass. So uh, with that, that allowed me to move into the the second half of the PY year. So I'm currently in the last quarter. So last quarter as of uh, the beginning of May. Oh. Um, and I suppose where things shift a little bit, it's just reiterating, I suppose, some of the things Julie mentioned in the quarter two about being actually in meetings and, and presenting a part of it. I, I think a good way to look at it, look at it is we have to document the hours that we do, and, and, and each hour is documented under what we done, what we did in that period. Q1 and 2, there's like client observation meetings that you sit in there and observe. Well, in Q3 and 4, it's more like, okay, you're, having a fact, you're going through a fact find with a client. You need to do the risk profile questionnaire. You, you do the, pro, the, the questionnaire, not the advisor sitting there. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, you're, you're on the spotlight and you do it. And ticking off that you're doing those sorts of things, that, that makes up a large portion of Q3, Q3 and 4. There's more financial plans I need to write. So I've got to write um, at least two uh, statements of advice um, and a couple more strategic records of advice. And at first financial, as I mentioned earlier, we, we need to do this, the self-managed super fund course. So I'm doing that at the moment as, as we advise in that space. Mm. And then a little bit later towards the end of my, my last quarter, um, there's a couple of little requirements that I need to do, um, namely um, observe a couple of ethical dilemmas as I'm working uh, and how I've, I've managed that conflict you know, between what's, you know, best for the client and, and what could be a conflict in that space. So, I've got to observe two of those uh, and and write a little piece on and how I manage that conflict. Yep. So, yeah, that there, there's some of the other little things that I've got to do you know, in this last quarter. And then hopefully around sort of the August slash September period, I should be finished and, and be authorized. Nice. And then so, so the, the signing off on the professional year, that's – that's the business signs off on on that. So you know, I'm trying to help some others that you know, with businesses that might be looking at taking on an associate advisor with a view to helping them through professional year. I know for some people that might be some businesses that might be a little bit daunting. But but how, how does the how does the business support you through this? And who's ticking off different different things along the way? Yeah. So we. At the first instance, we have the advisor that we work with. So, from my understanding, the advisor that we work with has to have at least two to three years' experience. I, I don't know the exact number. So, that they're your first point of call. They're the first bit of support that, that you have there. Um, at the end of every quarter as well, we sit down with our compliance officer, his name is Sean, and go through what we've done throughout that period, discuss challenges we've had, uh, discuss areas that we might need some assistance with. So um, I think a really good example for that is when we have to write out statements of advice, we're able to lean on our power planning team to help us um, to using the, the, the well solver parts of X plan, those those things we don't use on a daily basis on our job. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're the other sort of teams around us that, that really assist us to get to – you know, tick off the things you need to do to be able to finish off that professional year. Yep. And 
maybe Julian, if you you comment on, do you, quite aside from you have to do the professional year yep. if you want to become a financial advisor, do you feel it's also a worthwhile exercise in your own kind of career development or or not? Do you think it maybe it holds you back in in some places? No, I certainly think it helps you. you know, it's a, it's a big step from being an associate advisor to an advisor to be able to have a a regimented training plan to make sure that you're ready to go out into basically a new world, it certainly helps. Yep. Um, you, you spend time developing your soft skills, which you really need to do so that when you actually take the steps to become an advisor, you know you're ready to do it, not just coming straight out of your uni course into an advisor role where clients might think you're green and things like that. Having a regimented uh, training plan is definitely going to help future advisors to make sure that they're ready and deliver the best client experience possible. Do either of you have, you know, maybe last 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 few minutes we'll have a chat, but do either of you have any any tips for anyone else that might be, you know, that maybe they're just about they're, they're in their last year of uni and they're, you know, aspiring to get into financial advice or they're doing the whole career change thing like you did, Julian. Do yeah. either of you have any any tips for anyone that that, that might be Looking at doing it, if you, you know, if you could go back and say, oh, maybe I would have done this thing a little bit differently, I would have done that thing a little bit differently. Any tips, or even a, a question that I get asked, and I'd love to get the opinion from the two of you: like, where do you even start in terms of a job in financial advice? Got any tips like that? Yeah. So when I started, I reckon I did about twenty uh, job applications to financial planning firms, um, where I sent off my resume for entry level roles and, and got nowhere. Uh, the one that got me was I had to make a make a phone call, so I didn't submit a resume. So I had to talk about myself and talk talk myself up, basically, and that's how I, I got the first role. But it's just keep applying and apply as soon as possible. So as soon as you know you want to go into that industry or you're considering starting uni, take the hit early on, especially if you're sort of on a larger wage and you need to take a, a step back. Do it as early as possible and try and get that entry level role as soon as possible because it will help you in the long term. So. I had three years' experience by the time I finished my bachelor's degree in, in financial planning of, of different roles, and I felt that was a big help. We see people come into our firm that go into CS roles that just finish in uni, where I sort of took the different approach and started while I was in uni, so that way when I finished the degree, I've got that experience behind me and the knowledge. Yeah, I, I'd agree about the same thing. I think it's important you start as a cl- in the client services role. It gives you a, a good um, grounding of um, it's the back end side of the business, and then my tip would be just to be to be as inquisitive as you can. You know, a lot of the time advisors are happy enough to have you into a review meeting, so tap them on the shoulder and ask if that if you can do that. If you're working through a, a you know implementation of this advice, take a step back and ask, but why are we doing it? And again, people in the industry are more than happy to explain the reasoning to young people, you know, to give them a chance. So something I would I would definitely do, and then in terms of the the professional year, I, I think you'd, if if you think a, a career in financial planning is something that you want and you want to be an advisor, I would start it as early as possible. The reason for that, and I was interested in Julian's response, but I, I do feel like the professional year it, it can it can go on for a long period of time, and a lot of the beginning of it is is documenting things that you've been doing for a long time anyway. Mm-hmm. So start as early as you can because, as I said, the first part is that observation piece. So it's just literally writing down, these are the things I did today yeah. um, at the beginning of it. So if you can start earlier, I think that puts you in a better position to, to and not feel like you're, you're, you're sort of doing the same things for a long period of time. Do you think start, start it earlier and then you'll, you'll finish it earlier or just start it earlier and instead of taking one year, you take two years or you take three years to do your professional year but as you're kind of just growing in your role, you're also ticking off the things that yeah, you need to do as part that's of it. Exactly. As you're growing in your role, you're ticking off what you need to do to, to finish your professional year as well. Yeah. Because it's, I think it's a bit of a, a misconception that it's a professional year. It's a professional 18 months. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. maybe even longer. Because uh, there are, you know, we, we've touched on the exam. If, you, if you're unfortunate to not pass the exam, you can't go to the next stage until you passed. They run the exams like Julian, you might know a bit better than me, quarterly basis. Yeah, run. quarterly basis. And once you sit the exam, you've got to wait six weeks for your results. Yeah. So there's so, quite a, a time delay between. Say, yeah, so this, I think this sort of really builds on my point I was making earlier. It's not it's not a 12 months. It's more, more like 18 plus. 
So um, if you can start it as early as possible, if you think an advisor is a role you want to do, talk to your management about starting it as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for joining me today. Um, as I said at, at the outset, I get asked fairly regularly about the career paths and so forth in financial advice. I thought I'd ask the two of you on giving you two are living that right now and it's a bit more relevant um, versus what I did many, many years ago. So thank you for joining me. Um, really appreciate it. And um, I'll see you in the office soon because yes. <laughs> John, you're on. Thanks very much, Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, John. Bye.